I get the, the children who might rock their head back and forth. And there's a lot of times where they are switching back and forth between two images. Yes. Wow. So in that they don't necessarily sit for my optometric evaluation <laughs> right. in a way that a, a neurotypical person might, but being able to observe their behavior and through different uh, tasks or games or whatever it is that we bring out in that day, really are able to determine that they're, they are really switching back and forth between two different ways of seeing and searching for something that is meaningful. Welcome Dr. Sarah Lane to Mother's Guide Through Autism podcast. We are so thrilled and honored that you're joining us today. Thank you for having me. It's an honor to be here. So we're going to just dive right in because uh, we have so much to talk about, learn about from you. And I would like to know, how did you become interested in developmental optometry? Um, I would say uh, developmental optometry kind of found me. Uh, when I had vision problems starting in second grade is when I first got glasses uh, and struggled to read, um, struggled with learning, was always a very determined person who managed somehow to make the grade without necessarily doing things the, the way my classmates or my sister did. Um, and then, you know, I worked really hard through elementary school, high school, was always on high honor roll, but again, did things my own way. Uh, when I got to optometry school, um, I, was, I was having headaches every day and I could choose whether to look at the board far away or the slides that were presented or look at my notes. I couldn't make switches back and forth or I would have a, a, a headache that would last you know, the rest of the afternoon making it difficult to study. And I, I was a student at the Pennsylvania College of Optometry and I went to the Eye Institute for my eye exam, my first year of optometry school and the uh, fourth year student who was doing my exam, kind of nervous because I couldn't provide the same data for the testing that was being done like repeatedly. So I was diagnosed with a vision problem, a problem with focusing and two-eye coordination that I was recommended to have vision therapy. And prior to that, I had never heard of vision therapy, had no, uh, and nobody had ever said I could do anything about the way that my eyes worked. I was in optometry school because I had glasses and contacts and I knew my optometrist really well and thought it was a good career path. And then I needed vision therapy and it completely changed the trajectory of my education and my career. Wow. I love that is such a cool story about how you just started a career and then it ended up involving your own health, your own yes. vision and I, how that led you to doing what you're doing right now. Right. That is so. Yeah, I think that my, yeah, my personal experience with having a vision problem, I think has allowed me to interpret some of the symptoms that my patients uh, describe because uh, I understand what it feels like and how difficult it is to put into words what it, what it's, what it's like to have a vision problem, to what it's like to, to feel what it's like to, you know, not have consistent access to clear, comfortable, single vision. Mm. It's not something that the majority of people ever experience. Yeah. So you have a connection that you, a deep connection with your, your patients um, that you wouldn't otherwise have because you, you have that level of empathy. Look, I, I know, I know. Yeah. Yeah, that is, that is great. Um, so how has your practice evolved to include work with infants and special needs children? So you just told us your background and your why. And so how does right. that work? So along the way, I became very interested in movement and yoga and my own practice of, you know, becoming a, a student of of yoga and movement, uh, I really saw the changes in my own vision as I was going through vision therapy, as well as practicing a lot of yoga and movement, uh, and brought me to um, question, like, 
how does uh, the organization and movements of the body impact the visual system? So when I was a resident at, the, at SUNY, SUNY State College of Optometry in New York, I questioned like if we do body movement exercises that are you know based in uh, reflexes and early movement patterns d can that change how the visual system works so i did all my research that year in that uh, vein um, and came up with a lot of information about uh, the gestational period like when a baby is inside the mom like what what matters as far as experiences um, and then the birth process and the early infancy um, time as being really impactful for development of uh, the foundations of visual development. So that kind of started things off, you know, for me. And then I had my own children and uh, <laughs> used the, the things I had learned academically to make some decisions for myself um, per, uh, around my uh, birth plan and how I chose to have my own children and treat their early infancy time. Uh, so that has, again, brought my personal experience into my professional life where because I, uh, I did it myself and for my own children, I've really seen the, the, the impacts that those decisions have had. Uh, and I try to share uh, wh what my experiences are with other people. So, yeah, because I'm pretty sure our listeners are, are going to connect with things that um, are going on maybe with their, themselves listening to you, um, but also their kids, because I know for myself, um, I was unaware of all of this uh, with my son, Joseph. So I know that there, there are listeners, moms, parents, uh, educators that this is really going to help a lot of a lot of people with our listeners. So right. I, yeah. I want to, yeah, go ahead. Uh, yeah. I was uh, fortunate enough to uh, meet uh, Patricia Lemmer of uh, the Developmental Delay Resources uh, early in my career. And she really helped me to, uh, to see some of the, the pieces of the puzzle. Uh, for development that then allowed me to make some of those decisions for myself with confidence um, around my preparation for pregnancy, my birth, and then that early infancy time. Um, yeah. You know, she introduced me to the idea that uh, every person is, is born with um, what she calls like a bucket. <laughs> you know, there's a certain amount of uh, toxin and experience and trauma and stress that a person can handle before that bucket begins to overflow. Um, and so when we experience that overflow is when we start to see symptoms of dysfunction in our nervous system and our uh, digestive system and all our skin and you know, all different parts of the body. So I had known those things prior uh, to having my own children. So I really was trying to keep their bucket as empty as possible. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So, yeah. 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 Patty is, um, has been a, a, a guest on Mother's Guide Through Autism. And um, if you haven't heard that episode, definitely you're going to want to listen to it. Um, she's fascinating on so many levels. Her book, Outsmarting Autism, is a great reference. If if you're not familiar with Patty, uh, please check her out because like Dr. Lane is explaining, she has so, so much knowledge um, and she's great at explaining the whys behind um, so many things that people are looking for, uh, especially particularly with vision. And because in the special needs um, community, and I know my son is on the autistic spectrum, it's really, it's really tough because we have so many different things going on and not every child uh, is the same. So when you're, when you're working with the special needs population and we have, it, it is, it's, it's, it's like a, a maze, right? Which direction do we go? Where do we start? How do we navigate it? Um, how do you help families do that? 
What I really start with is a kind of a philosophical conversation of not getting stuck and taking a step back to really think about where we've been, where we are and where we need to get to um, and to recognize that there is a flow and a kind of interconnectedness of a variety of different things that need to come together in order to get us forward to a place that is different. Um, and that really, it, it takes a, a, a very broad holistic approach. Uh, we're not going to, you know, take one little thing and do that and have it shift everything else most of the time. You know, sometimes we're lucky enough to find a little bit of a key that opens things up, but most of the time it's putting a lot of different pieces together uh, that over time just allow us to shift um, and trying really hard to just never get stuck in, um, in thinking that nothing's ever going to change. Uh, there's no power that I have to, to make a shift or change. A lot of the people that I see, uh, I, I feel like haven't been given the permission um, to shift for themselves what it means for them, their children, their entire family unit to be uh, empowered, successful, healthy people. And they're looking for other people to tell them exactly what needs to be done every step of the way. So I really do try to look at each, each case, each family um, as an opportunity to pay attention a little bit more to some of those details and have them develop a way of helping themselves at the same time as helping their children. Yeah. And I, I love that. That is what I do in my coaching because it's, it's not just about finding answers or the answers. It's also about your heart healing and, you know, taking care of of yourself and understanding that this is not something that's going to last a week or two weeks or th this is a journey, right? And so um, getting through the grief, there's a lot of grief, a lot of emotional things that go on uh, with, with families um, and moms in particular is who I work with because there's that guilt judgment. So what I'm hearing is I work with the whole mom and you work with the whole family in, <laughs> you know, it, it, and that's remarkable for a physician, for a doctor, because I haven't had many experiences where you give that extra emotional support and guidance. So I mean, yeah, I often get asked, you know, why does my child struggle with vision? Why, why do I need this help? Why does my child need this help? And um, I, I do try to get away from that why and yeah. try to get us to move forward um, because it does. Like when we start to analyze all of the little details, it brings us to the past. It brings us to a place that, you know, might feel you know, like we have to deal with the decisions that we made then, like may not have been ideal, but they really don't come into how we need to move forward. Yeah. And, and that's getting in a little deeper of what you mean by not getting stuck. Yes. Yeah. So we, we can't go backwards. We meet ourselves where we're at. And now how do we move forward one beautiful step at a time, right? Yes. And um, I love that. I love that. I, uh, again, there's not in my small experience in, in the big wide world, I have not come across very many doctors that, um, that do that. So kudos to you, Dr. Lane, because I think that's beautiful. Um, yeah. So as a doctor, how do you effectively work with infants and people with special needs since they can't verbally tell you as much about what is happening? I think working with infants and special needs people requires uh, observational skills, <laughs> uh, intuition, 
uh, the deeply held belief that they are people, regardless of their ability to verbalize what's going on, um, and respecting the response that they may have to anything that I do, or you know what the symptoms might be that they're coming to me with, you know whether that's stress, anxiety, difficult with development, difficult with behavior, difficulty with eye contact, like you know the variety of things that I get. Um, sometimes the symptoms that bring them to me aren't aren't necessarily directly uh, related to what would be traditionally thought of as a visual symptom, but I you know I, I listen to what is brought to me but really, really trying to make sure that I'm in a space where I can connect with them um, and then develop the, the program, the tools, the, the things that we need to move forward out of that place of struggle. I have found that, you know, sitting with somebody who, you know, has autism or a kind of a developmental difficulty where they aren't able to verbalize, just looking them in the eye and saying, you know, I understand that things are difficult for you right now. You know, I understand that it might be scary for you to be here with me as a new person, somebody that you've never met before. You know, this is what we're going to do. We're going to do this thing first and then we're gonna do the next thing. I give them like that, that play by play verbally, even though they might not necessarily be able to tell me back that they understand. The energy of that situation allows uh, a welcoming of me into their world that I really feel like needs to be there before I can bring any of my, my clinical expertise into it. I think that is so beautiful. I, um, when, when I work with, with moms, you know, the, the, the kids know what's up. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> they know. Um, it, it may not appear that they know, but they know. And I have learned that um, through my own experience, because my son now is 28, and his memories are on point. Right. And when I didn't think he was um, taking it all in, he was a sponge, he knew everything, he understood everything, and he could read. And I had, you know, there's so much going on. Um, uh, with them. So I, I love that. I love the respect that you offer, offer them. And sometimes so. it takes patience. It takes a lot of patience. And I think it yeah. takes a lot of uh, kind of philosophical switch sometimes for the families that come to me as well, uh, because there is a rapport building that takes time. You know, you can't just dive right in with clinical procedure you know, especially with somebody who might be scared uh, or who might not fully understand why they're there. Mm -hmm. And they may have had prior experiences with people who look like me, have offices that look like mine that maybe haven't been on that same page to really respect and understand, you know, where they're coming from. Yes, because um, my experience with my son has been what he experiences is filed away forevermore. So the only way to dissolve that experience is to have a, a newer one, which does take longer, which, which does for all of us. I mean, once you break trust, it takes a long time to get that tr trust back. Um, and they don't do it on an individual basis. They do it by their experiences. So I, I, I do that. So I love, I love how you take the whole person and engage them and build the trust. And what my hunch would be is that the, then the therapies are much more effective because they're able to truly participate and, and be part of what it is that, that you're doing to help them. Absolutely. I mean, my, the way that I do therapy has evolved over the years uh, and looks different with me in my office than the way a lot of other people do it. You know, I only know mine intimately, <laughs> yeah. but I have brought in um, a lot of different uh, experiences I've had in my life into helping people develop their visual skills. Uh, I have a lot of experience with the body movements. Uh, so I've taken uh, a lot of coursework with MNRI, uh, Svetlana Muscatova's work. I've done a lot of reading with uh, the Feldenkrais method. I am a certified Kripalu yoga instructor. 
Uh, I practice yoga on a regular basis and meditation and breath work. And um, there's, there's, there's a lot that I bring into uh, a session, uh, even before we get into uh, my work as an optometrist. <laughs> yeah, so it's all inclusive. What it sounds like to me is mind, body, spirit, but I could be wrong. Um, I think that's what it is. I have, uh, I've resisted the bringing in the spirit uh, aspect to, you know, when somebody presents to me as a developmental optometrist, I try to make sure that I am primarily uh, keeping my focus on their visual symptoms. But when somebody does decide that I am going to be the person to help them, all of it comes into it. Yeah, and that's what it sounds like. And, and that's what what the whole person is, <laughs> you know, so we take into account that there, there's, you know, there's a lot of emotional stress, um, on, on the, on all the, all the family members. And, um, I can only, uh, imagine how helpful and healing it is. Uh, I know that there was a therapist that I worked with, um, with Joseph and his AIT therapy, um, many, many years ago in the nineties when there wasn't a lot out there. But what I realized is they were, it was a, a wife and, and, uh, and husband team. They were counseling me too, except I didn't know it. <laughs> <laughs> and when, <laughs> until, yeah, until we were driving away and I got so emotional because um, I realized how much healing that I had had and needed to do to be able to help my son. So I think, again, I keep saying this, but it's so true. It's unique um, to be able to work with a, a physician, a doctor that takes all of that and that you understand it, that you're going to get so much further uh, in your physical wellness um, to incorporate all the other movement and well-being and we won't call it spiritual we'll call it healing <laughs> yeah. a lot of the symptoms that you know, a lot of the the problems that uh, people come in identifying often have to do with getting their child to do something that they've decided they want them to do and they've decided that there's a right way to do it and a certain time to do it and you know there's a structure that they bring to it and i, I need my my child to be able to do this now in exactly the way that I want them to do it mm. um, without recognizing that their child's resistance is giving them some information about the approach. So yeah. I really do try to help parents understand, you know, what can I shift about this experience that may end up with the, the same final outcome, but be a very different experience for everybody involved. Yeah, so that's part of the observation and intuition, right? If somebody's resisting something, uh, there there's more than likely a reason, and especially if they're nonverbal, there's only so many ways that we communicate. Or you know, so if you're looking at a child who is having meltdowns and resisting, and their their cups or buckets are full. Absolutely. And so let's take a breath and step back and, and find another way. I, yeah, that is spot on. So if you're listening and you're, you're just, I just want our listeners to just take that in for a minute, because if a lot of us are, are at home right now, um, homeschooling, doing lots of our own therapies as parents. Um, so just to kind of take that in and, and uh, take a step back, take three deep breaths and try to find another way that, that maybe would be win-win um, for yourself. Uh, I love that. So getting into that, uh, do you, I would love, I, I love when we share success stories because this podcast is about knowledge, absolutely but it's also about hope and inspiration. And I do believe these success stories that I know that you have are going to help autism moms, parents, educators, whoever's listening with, with vision therapy. Right. 
success stories are so many trying to pick the ones that are uh, most relevant um uh you know one particular boy i can remember vividly right now is uh you know he was in uh, middle school seventh eighth grade um very much struggling with doing the things that his teachers wanted him to do in exactly the same way that they wanted to do them every single time. (laughs) (laughs) However, an extremely smart person. Um, And when he came to me, he was seeing double pretty much all of the time. And that double vision was a lot related to the stress within his body. Okay, so he is showing up into my office with clearly what's called an exotropia, the eyes being pointed out. Uh, And I really needed to help him figure out at the foundational level uh, how we could deal with all of those stressors that were underlying that difficulty that he was having with his vision. So, I mean, I brought in a lot of my different modalities. You know, I start off with the body work. I start off with um, simple movements that kind of uh, balance the the nervous system. And we work from there. Uh, And now he is not seeing double. Um, So as he enters high school, he still has some struggles with doing things that other people want him to do in exactly the way that they want them to do. He wants them to be done. Uh, but he's not seeing double. He's able to much more thoroughly uh, articulate what's happening uh, because we've given him those tools and also that recognition of like, what does it feel like when I get stressed? You know, when does my heart rate start to go up? When do my shoulders come high? And that changes how my eyes work. Mm. So helping him to to see those steps along the way has really helped. I love that insight, how he can then take control of his own. He has his own tools, his own toolbox to help himself. Absolutely. Uh, People often ask me, you know, does vision therapy work? Am I going to be having to do vision therapy for the rest of my life, for the rest of my life with my child? And the, my approach to vision therapy is that my goal is to teach a person how their visual system works and teach them tools to continuously maintain organization within the visual system. Uh, There's nothing that I do to a person in the course of vision therapy. Really what I'm doing is allowing a person to have an experience that uh, gets them more connected with how their eyes and their visual system works. And yes, it can happen for somebody who is nonverbal <laughs> and not able to articulate uh, what's going on because we see it in changes in their behavior. We see it in their, their willingness to, to look and learn and approach tasks differently uh, once we've given them those, those tools for organization. And again, I honestly believe that they hear me. Yeah. Um, regardless, of, regardless of whether they can speak back to me, uh, they know what's going on. Yeah, I believe that too. I, I, uh, I do too. And so, wow, that is a very inspirational story. I cannot imagine going into a classroom, or just the whole thing, even socially, and seeing double um what a life changing right uh, that changed his life absolutely and a lot of times the i get the the children who might rock their head back and forth and there's a lot of times where they are switching back and forth between two images yes wow so in that they don't necessarily sit for my optometric evaluation (laughs) <laughs> in right. a way that a, a neurotypical person might, but being able to observe their behavior and through different uh, tasks or games or whatever it is that we bring out in that day, really are able to determine that they're, they are really switching back and forth between two different ways of seeing and searching for something that is meaningful. Mm. So so they're trying, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, I'm I'm just thinking about all the kids that 
or even adults that are just trying to figure the world out through their vision. Yes. Yes. So when I see that kind of searching disorganized type behavior, and then they also might come with, well, they can play their own games. They can read their play on the iPad or the phone and all day long without any, you know, without exhibiting any of these uh, searching visual behaviors. And so then the task is to become, so what about the time that they are exhibiting these behaviors is that is stressful is not being integrated into their whole being for allowing them to to gather that information. Do you feel like um, this therapy, the everything that we're talking about today is, is very well known. Um, Is it out there? I mean, I, I don't, because for me, it doesn't feel that way, but I could be wrong. I, it doesn't feel like this is something that we just know. We know about occupational therapy. We know about, you know, certain, which are important therapies, but I feel like vision therapy and movement is just kind of left over there somewhere, or maybe it's just not out there yet. Well, it, it is out there. A lot of people know about vision therapy. Uh, I do feel like over the last you know, 20 to 30 years, which my career only started a little more than 15 years ago. (laughs) So, you know, there's autism is new and different to a lot of professionals. Uh, And it takes time for people to understand and shift what the needs of the people that we're seeing are. I think one of the most difficult things is, uh, is that there's not a can, there's not like a, a programmed approach that works every single time. And we've struggled in, you know, in medicine to, to think we need always that double blind clinical trial to prove that something works before we give it any credibility. And it just doesn't work that way when you're clinically sitting with a person who's struggling. So really what, you know, I've tried to do is take that doctor-esque type of information that I, you know, I I need, or I used to think I needed in a certain way, and then had to evolve how I gather it, and then evolve how I intervene uh, with different approaches that don't look like what I learned when I was in school. Um, So, and it's, medicine is quick to discredit things that they don't know, Okay, and everybody does vision therapy, optometric vision therapy, different. So it's very challenging to uh, to kind of know what you're in for or know what you're going to get, because there is a lot that is uh, therapist dependent. <laughs> uh, I can't put the what I do in a can. I can't necessarily. <laughs> I haven't, I haven't ventured into teaching somebody how to do things the way that I do them yet, uh, because there are so many different aspects that come into, you know, how I work with the people that present to me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I I can see that. I just, um, and, and maybe it's because, uh, autism particularly is still such a mystery and, um, you know, like my son says, if you've met one autistic person, you've met one. So, but I, but I do think like there are some, some signs, you know, that we, we could, um, and again, this isn't going to solve it or um, be able to, to find every individual that needs vision therapy, but you know, like the, the, what you mentioned, the side to side, there are certain things that uh, our kids are doing to compensate for and trying to understand how to learn how to read in this and that. I mean, being in, in junior high and seeing double, that's, that's like, that would, to me is so, wow. <laughs> it's like, that's yeah. such an aha um, that we have work to do. Yes. And it's not, it's hard to understand too, because it's not necessarily something that happens a hundred percent of the time for these kids. There's fluctuation, there's variation, there's things that are, you know, situational. 
Yes. Yeah. That we again have to appreciate, have to appreciate that. And that, that also makes it sometimes difficult to measure mm. because uh, what's happening in the classroom, what's happening in their life, you know, I may not be able to duplicate that in my initial evaluation. Yes. I have all kinds of signs and symptoms and indicators that this person is struggling, but that hard black and white, like this is the mark I make on my, you know, examination form, it's a softer uh, process, you know, in evaluation. Right. It, makes it makes it hard for medicine to understand, it makes it hard for that, that really left brained uh, document every single detail, it makes it hard to understand. Yes, and, and that's what I love. I love the way you do things because it, it is the whole child and it is taking um, into consideration many, many things, hence the observation and the intuition and all the beautiful pre-work that you do. But with, with our listeners, if, if I'm listening and how do I know, how does an autism mom or parent know um, to look into working with a vision therapist? I think the first step is to have a conversation with the provider that you may be going to. Uh, make sure that the provider uh, knows a little bit of the story of what your concerns are, what your struggles are, and what you're looking for. Um, so that the provider uh, can make sure that they're the right person for you to see. Mm. Um, there's a, there's a network of us, you know, developmental optometrists all around the world. And, you know, we like to help each other find, uh, we like to help the people who, com who contact us find the help that they need. So if, you know, I might not be the exact person for somebody to see, you know, I will look for one of my colleagues to help out. So, and I think that can also help families uh, not get into an office or not get into a, to see a provider where they're not getting what they're looking for. That's good advice. Okay, okay. so that would be the first step. And, for, and make sure that, the, that there's kind of that, that triage happens before you show up in the office. Okay. Because there's sometimes, there's preparation of the staff, there's preparation of the space that sometimes is necessary uh, given different situations. So the, the more that can be kind of communicated and prepared for ahead of time, the, the better situation we'll, we'll all have. Yeah, that, that gives you a good idea of what, what's going on with the child and so that you can be ready and be able to help the family. That makes sense. Yeah. So that's a great first step. So um, tell us about Meaningful Moves. Okay, so Meaningful Moves uh, is a, a program of exercises that I have been working on for a number of years. Uh, and really what these, these Meaningful Moves are, are exercises that parents can do uh, with their children uh, that really set the foundation for sensory and motor and visual skill development. So it started off where I was teaching movement classes for mothers and babies. Um, and as well as a yoga teacher, as a certified yoga teacher, and it kind of evolved like I wasn't really able to be just the yoga teacher. I was always the developmental optometrist teaching yoga. <laughs> so I would bring a lot of, uh, uh, lessons, I would say, to my, my movement classes. Um, and then now, as things have evolved, I, I really am trying to package these types of movements to be things that, that parents can learn, regardless of the diagnosis that their child might have, regardless of uh, where their concerns are, that we can provide uh, input and information to our young children that will help the developmental uh, trajectory of things. Um, I've found that a lot of young parents are again looking for permission uh, to do things with their children. They're, they're scared to move them. 
they have to stay safe. They have to stay in the bucket. They have to stay in the car seat. They have to stay in the stroller. Um, we're very scared to do things wrong. We need our, the permission of the pediatrician, the permission of a professional for what do I need to do at what specific time. So Meaningful Moves is uh, kind of a, my, my goal is to help people have a framework of moving with their young children, um, babies starting you know, on the day of birth if they feel comfortable with that, but very early with experiences of sensory and motor uh, exercises to help their development. Again, uh, that is that is really interesting um, because there it makes first of all it makes a lot of sense. So we, we're learning so much uh, from you today. So can you give us an idea of what exercises you would teach in the videos? Um, yeah, there's. There's five exercises that I've chosen for like the, the, the meaningful moves that are the out, in, out there for everybody <laughs> to see and uh, do with their children. Um, they start with a, what I call like the hand map or I have hands, which is a lot of uh, different sensory input into the hand that educates the, the fingers, um, the palm of the hand for reaching and grasping objects. Um, it is really like with our hands that we first reach out and touch that guide our vision, guide our eyes to where we need to look. Um, and then we go to the feet where it's, I have feet, you know, the, I call it the foot map where we again, educate the body um, about where the feet are and the toes and the, how the feet move. And then we do an exercise uh, where we go from side to side, where the whole body with the child lying on the back moves from side to side. So we're crossing midline and our head is moving. So we're getting vestibular activation. And then we go up and down where we're again with the child on the back kind of lifting the hips. So we're giving the spine a nice massage as we do that moving through space up and down. Uh, and then the last one that I have in the, the five meaningful moves videos is where the baby goes upside down. So it's kind of, we bring the baby all the way up into the air, off the ground with their head dangling, you know, close to the ground. And we wait for their body to respond to gravity. So uh, a well-organized body will not allow itself to fall on its face. So what we see is we see a change in the head posture. We see a change in the arms coming down to reach for the ground. But babies who are not in that position often don't find that. So I through see. this exercise, we really give that opportunity for them to put all those pieces together. You know, I mean, babies often sleep on their backs now, which doesn't allow them when they first wake up or squirm in the night to put their hands in front of their face to mm -hmm. find that space. Um, they're not moving their knees underneath their body to find that space for where am I? Oh, wow. Yeah, that's, so that's the Meaningful cool. Moves really uh, provides a lot of those experiences. Um, and gives gives young parents a framework. And I yeah, so these these videos, and we're going to get into that of of where parents um, and listeners can find them because I think that sounds like something I I would have definitely done with both my 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 children. Um, I know that you have um, a book an upcoming book. Can you tell us about it? Yes. Yeah, so the Meaningful Moves Project has been going on for about 10 years, different, uh, different little tidbits here and there. But I recently put together with the help of my friend, Elizabeth Barker, who did beautiful paintings for the book, uh, a, a guide to these five exercises. Um, and the book uh, is going to, uh, going to be out very soon in print. Uh, but what it does is it's, it's really designed for parents. It's not designed as a textbook. It's not designed as like something that you, you know, sit with for weeks to learn and study you know, all aspects of movement and development. It's really meant to be a quick guide. And it's, you know, written with one side, gives a, the description of the exercise, 
and the other side of the page has the pictures and a, a cute little poem to go with the movement. So after you learn the exercises, you don't necessarily need to read all the narrative and all of the, the detailed instructions. You can use the nice pictures and, <laughs> and the poem, you know, to have it be like a, a read along with your child as you do the exercises uh, on, a, on a daily basis. So my ideas for the Meaningful Moves book is that it can become something uh, that is easily giftable, easily like, you know, I, I know somebody who's having a baby, um, or who has had a baby and you know these exercises can help them. Um, you know one of the other underlying themes in Meaningful Moves is that by having uh, our hands on our children in meaningful ways we do learn to pay attention a little bit more. Uh, we develop that intuition of what they are feeling uh, and I think that we we all can use a little bit more of that as we it's easy to fall into the looking to other people to give us the, the information when really it might be there right for us between us and our child. Mm, it's just, it sounds like a great way to, to have a deeper connection um, with our children. And this is for all, all kids, right? All, all kids. I, I, I put together this book really because I don't have time in my professional life to see every person <laughs> who may have some kind of concerns. The babies who come into my office now typically are referred by other providers where there's an identifiable uh, developmental difficulty. Um, and I'm doing much more than these five meaningful moves exercises in the, the session with me. Um, but often the core of what parents are doing at home is these five exercises that I have hands, I have feet, I can go side to side, I can go up and down and I can go upside down. Those five tend to be the, the, the framework of what provides the body and the nervous system with kind of a, a holistic experience to encourage development. Yes, and I know that um, whoever listens to this this episode is going to want to know the name of the book, where to get the book. Uh, so, can you give us that information? Because I have a hunch we're going to want to go out and buy it. <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> the, the book is called Meaningful Moves: uh, Optimizing Your Child's Development is the subtitle. Uh, the book will be available on Amazon uh, as well as on. Uh, one of my websites, my, you know, the one website where I have all of the videos is called uh, movewithyourbaby.com. And then also on my office website, which is focusvisioncenter.com. Yeah. So, so if I'm listening and um, I want you to be my physician, to be my doctor, um, can you do this all? Can you help people all over um, since there's so much online presence right now uh, through this COVID um, pandemic period. Uh, do you work with people online? I do work with people online and it is something that I wouldn't necessarily have, have thought to do had I not been thrust into it in uh, you know, March of 2020. Uh, but I have found ways that are very effective to work virtually. Um, uh, a lot of times I am seeing people in the office for an initial evaluation, if that is possible, and then transitioning into the experiences happening remotely, uh, which has been very rewarding. And I think for parents as well, because in the past where therapy was more my hands on everybody and my doing the things in this virtual format, parents really are learning alongside their children Mm -hmm. um, about the visual process and how they can help their children and themselves and often giving themselves therapeutic experiences along the way. Um, I also am able to work, you know, where if it may not be possible for me to see the person physically in the office, uh, it's possible for, you know, uh, an eye exam to be done with a, a colleague and then for the, the consultation, for the, the movement, the vision, the how are we going to intervene, um, 
using some of my techniques can also happen virtually. Okay, that's really good to know because, you know, I, I live in a rural area and uh, I live in Mountain Home, Arkansas. And so I know I was always looking for things. And if I would have heard this podcast, I would be like, okay, how do I, <laughs> how do I begin working with you? So th that's a, that's one of the, I guess, the, the positives um, that we've, we've learned through this um, pandemic is that uh, we can, in fact, learn and do things different ways that we would have never thought about before. <laughs> yeah. I do have on my websites a way to, you know, book a conversation, a consultation with me. Uh, these conversations can't necessarily be called an evaluation or, you know, therapy, but they're consultations at, that can be impactful for, again, allowing a shift for where you are and where you might need to go. And that it, it could be, you know, my helping you to put some of those pieces together about who's the next practitioner or provider or therapy that might help my child. Again, by deeply listening uh, to where you are, um, you know, I can help mm -hmm. navigate that path. Yeah, so that consultation could, could also be a first step for some, some of us, right? Yes. Um, Great. That's great. Um, I would uh, like to know what your best advice is. What advice do you have for autism moms? The best advice I have is to take a deep breath uh, and pay attention to your child and pay attention to yourself. Um, take one step at a time to make sure that each movement or each step gets you to a better place mind body and spirit if it doesn't feel right it's probably not right or maybe not the right time for that mm -hmm. um and you know keep an open mind uh and Keep searching for the providers, the practitioners who understand you, understand your child, or who are willing to take the time that it takes to put in to understanding the situation. Yeah, that that is great advice. Um, so many of us want to just jump in, rush in. It's it's a, a little period of panic sometimes, and I think that's that's very good advice. Um, I would also like to know, um, well, several things. Before we go, what would you like to to tell us? What's going on that's new? Um, I know that you're working on on many different things because we've we've had that conversation. So what would you like to mention before we go? Everything has shifted in 2020. Uh, my practice is very different than it was before. Uh, seeing less patients physically in the office, more patients virtually, uh, really working to um, even further empower people to develop the tools to help themselves. Uh, parents, children, all ages, uh, helping people to really pay attention to how stress impacts vision and how it's not a, a constant necessarily um, has definitely become a, a path that I didn't necessarily see uh, when I was in the office, <laughs> you know, kind of running through the schedule of, you know, eight to nine patients, you know, in the course of a short period of time. I think seeing that space has allowed my practice to evolve a little bit. And the, the meaningful moves aspect of getting the information out to more people that you can make a change, you can help your child early and often is what the keys are. Um, where can, what is the best way to connect with you for our listeners? The best way to connect with me is to find my phone numbers and the email addresses on my websites. Uh, can you give us your websites one more time for our listeners? 
Uh, sure, my office website is focusvisioncenter.com and the baby movement specific website is movewithyourbaby.com. And we can buy your book on Amazon. On Amazon, or I'll have the links directly on my websites as well. Perfect. Okay. Well, I, I t- took notes as I always do. This was an interview filled with um, great advice, great teachings, um, and great, um, I want to say for me, uh, uh, for those of you listening, this is full of knowledge hope and inspiration, which is exactly what this podcast is, is meant for. So I feel like we, we hit all those points in this interview. And um, thank you so much, Dr. Sarah Lane, for being on Mother's Guide Through Autism. It's been my pleasure. Thanks for having me.